of you yesterday. Um, so thanks for thanks for bearing with my talk yesterday. Chitra asked me to come up uh, and talk again about some of the things that I find make good educators as a medical student, because as you know, uh, if you were at the talk yesterday, I have a bit of an unusual career where I've worn multiple hats, first as a student a decade ago, then as an educator myself with osmosis, and then uh, as a student again. So um, I wanted to share a few of the qualities that my favorite educators have, uh, as well as share a couple of real examples of people who are teaching me in medicine, uh, who I really appreciate, who embody these different qualities. And then I would love by tonight to get to know some of the educators um, who are being awarded uh, and honored tonight and expand the acronym TEACH uh, and hear more about the qualities that made them uh, get the recognition they, they deserve tonight. So again, well, who am I? Why are we talking about this? Some of you met me yesterday, uh, those of you who didn't. Um, basically, I briefly mentioned I started this health education company called Osmosis which is a uh, learning platform like Khan Academy but for healthcare. We have about 4 million uh, registered learners all around the world, mostly medical students, but also nursing, PA, pharmacy. We have a lot of vet and podiatry too, which I know is a big part of this conference as well. And so the hats I'm wearing are, one is a student, right? I did two years of med school, left for a decade, came back as a student, so I'm actively being educated in clinical medicine right now. Second, as an educator myself, um, even before osmosis, I, was, I wrote two education books, so I did a lot of middle school, high school uh, teaching and mentorship, uh, as well as peer mentorship in med school. And then uh, someone who's worked with a lot of awesome educators. So for example, our chief medical officer at osmosis is a guy named Rishi Desai, who um, was at Khan Academy before. He was their head of health and medicine at Khan Academy. And he's one of the best educators I've met. Uh, and so I've been able to work very closely with some of these amazing educators who've been recognized individually for what they can do, but also globally uh, through their online efforts. So, some of you may know this, but the origin of the word doctor is to teach. Uh, then we studied Latin in high school or college Latin. I, I think it's pronounced as a do docere or docere. So that is to teach, uh, and that eventually evolved into what we know as doctor, uh, the highest honor of, of education. And this is one of my, so my first favorite YouTube channel is obviously Osmosis. We have uh, a good number of, I think, 3 million subscribers now. This channel has over 8 million subscribers. If any of you haven't heard of this, most, most of you probably haven't, I recommend checking out the School of Life, um, especially if you have kids who are, you know, you're trying to, to raise, um, uh, to be interested in philosophy. Uh, they have a great video on what makes a good teacher. So yeah, take a picture of it, go to the School of Life, it's only six minutes, and they have a whole bunch of other good content, but I'm not going to play the video for the sake of time and people's appetites. So um, one thing I know that from osmosis is that a lot of us as healthcare professionals or students love acronyms. There's acronyms for everything. Uh, AEIOU for the causes of, or the reasons you need to do uh, emergent hemodialysis, or Vindicate for uh, organizing your differential diagnosis. Uh, mud piles for high anion gap metabolic acidosis, and then uh, SBAR as well. So these are just a couple of mnemonics. So I wanted to, to give you guys a mnemonic for teaching uh, and the things that I appreciate in teachers. And the, the mnemonic is obviously teach, trust, embody, advance, care, and humility. So these five qualities, they aren't comprehensive. There's obviously a lot of teachers who have a lot of other qualities that make them amazing mentors and educators. But these five, I want to boil it down and just put them in mind. So um, I'll go page by page. I share a lot of quotes. A couple of you said yesterday that you like, you like the quotes, you also are quote collectors. I love quotes. Uh, There's great ways to get an idea across. So there are a lot of quotes, and then very quickly I'll share one or two images of a teacher, a uh, medical teacher of mine who embodied this and why, why I appreciate that. So trust is first and foremost creating a supportive learning environment. I know uh, some of you uh, trained uh, a while ago where maybe the culture of medicine was a little more um, uh, harsh, I think. I think right now the culture has become a lot better than it used to be. And one of these quotes that I think about is how you need to uh, be as an educator is safety is the most basic task of all. Without a sense of safety, no growth can take place. Without safety, all the energy goes to defense. And I've certainly been in the OR during my surgery clerkship where I had a, a surgical uh, uh, resident who was just having a bad day or something and you know, decided to start pimping me before I even knew you know, who they were or their name. Um, and clearly you can't focus on learning when you're being um, 
you know, when you don't even know the person you're looking for or have that basic level of, of safety and trust. And so this is Dr. Gabriel Kedan. She's the head of the surgery clerkship at Hopkins um, and a, a very accomplished colorectal cancer surgeon. And day one of our surgery clerkship, she set the tone for the entire eight weeks. Um, because I'm sure some of you remember, maybe when you put yourself back to when you were doing your surgery clerkship, it has a reputation for being one of the more demanding ones. And um, you're going in these really life stakes or life and death situations. And so the last thing a surgeon wants to maybe do is deal with a med student who they'll never see again. Uh, and so Dr. GK, the caller, set the tone for the entire surgery clerkship by establishing that this was a place where like no harassment would be tolerated, um, that she had our backs, and that uh, you know, if, if any time we felt we weren't able, you know, we weren't treated well by anyone, we'd go directly to her and kind of get to talk through it. And that, that never happened. I mean, I think the culture of medicine before was a lot more mistreatment. People like her have, have made it much more trusting. Um, and then this is my current senior resident in my medicine clerkship, Dr. Matt Crow, who begins every morning as a before we round with a like a very humanizing question where we all go around before we round. I know many of you chose surgery because you don't like the endless rounding of, of medicine, but he takes about five minutes of our rounding to ask us a question, uh, like something as simple as, um, if you had a favorite superpower, what would it be? That humanizes each one of us, whether it's the med student or the attending in the room, and sets kind of a nice tone where we want to know each other as people first, and then as colleagues and, and, and students and mentors second. Second uh, quality in body, leading by example as a role model. So one of the most uh, humanitarian uh, physician educators and polymaths, um, some of you have heard of him, is Albert Schweitzer, who set up this massive hospital in, in Africa. Um, including a, a, a colony for lepers for over 200 lepers to stay, people with leprosy. Um, and he said, example is not the main thing in influencing others, it's the only thing. And so I think to be a good educator, uh, you, you, not, you not, only, not only have to have the knowledge to do, to, to impart or the skills, but you have to be someone that someone, that a mentee or a trainee wants to emulate. You embody kind of a well-lived life, not just you know a great surgeon, but someone that they want to be like. And so for me, two of the people I've met are Catherine DeAngelis. Uh, this is a portrait. She's still living, fortunately, but it's a, it's a portrait that hangs right in the medical education building at Hopkins. Uh, Dr. DeAngelis is um, most well known for being the first female editor-in-chief of, of JAMA. And uh, I met her 12 years ago when I was first uh, a med student. And I went uh, to ask for her advice because we were going to submit a paper that was the underpinning for osmosis to Jam, so I wanted her advice, and she gave me all this feedback and, and met, uh, help on that. Uh, she, when I first met her, I said, Dr. D'Angelo, she was in her 70s at the time, so now she's in her 80s. She said, uh, I asked her, Dr. D'Angelo, are you retired? And she said, Shiv, honey, I never tired the first time, how can I retire? Uh, which stuck, stuck with me, because she is someone who, I think, in her 70s and now in her 80s, has stayed sharp, has stayed committed to education, you know, has accomplished so much, but wound up taking a good hour um, synchronously and then some more time asynchronously to give me a first year med student at the time some advice on my paper. Another person is Patrick Walsh, uh, who I was, in, I was in urology rotation uh, last month or two months ago, and he at 86 was leading a clinic. Uh, so it was me and him, he was, you know, we were basically going around in clinic uh, doing prostate exams and uh, counseling patients um, on their prostate cancer diagnoses. And at, again, at 86, he's still trucking, but he's most well known for being the first person to um, create the nerve sparing prostatectomy. Uh, so back in the 80s, he, he made he found out, he articulated the aerovascular bundle that he could spare to prevent, um, uh, to reduce how much erectile dysfunction or bleeding um, or incontinence occurs because of prostate cancer. So these are two great examples of educators who, you know, if I were in my 80s, I could do, be half as sharp as them. Uh, and have this committed to the career, I think it'd be a win. The A is for uh, advance. So helping the learner achieve their goals, most of which are not actually just that education, right? And as an educator, it isn't just, I want this person to be able to pass the test or to uh, prove that they can do this robotic surgery. It's beyond that. It's, um, as Oprah said, a mentor is someone who allows you to see the hope inside yourself. So I'm sure these educators who I don't know, but the ones being recognized are probably great examples of people who've mentored people beyond just trying to get them to be excellent clinicians or fellow educators. And so one example of that for me is Dr. Daniele Rigamonti, 
who was the head of the hydrocephalus clinic at Hopkins uh, for many years before he went over to run Saudi Aramco's Hopkins Hospital in, in Saudi Arabia. And you know, we published a couple of papers together, uh, which he, he helped you know, with his name get kind of published uh, over a decade ago. But more importantly, he was the one professor who really supported me in my decision to leave med school to pursue osmosis. He said, look, like your career can zigzag, my career is zigzag, you can take the time off to do this thing. And, and it was kind of his blessing that it was one of the uh, bricks in the wall that you know, inspired me to leave and, and build something that wound up becoming um, a really good experience. C is care. So being passionate about the topic and the learner. So it's a little related to having their backs and, and uh, advancing them. But you know, I like this Mandela quote where it's, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So the things we do, or you all do as educators and teachers, really matters, right? It's, the, it's basically the underpinning for changing people's behaviors. And you guys in particular, as educators and clinicians, are not only helping those people you teach and train, you're helping the thousands of patients, tens of thousands of patients they're gonna see over the next few years um, because you educated them. And so it's a real privilege, and I think it's something you should be, and many of you obviously being here are, um, passionate about. Another quote from an unknown source is, teachers who love teaching, uh, teach children to love learning. So obviously, hopefully all of us feel, still feel like children in some way, but I think I definitely experienced it where two of my professors here at Hopkins, uh, Dr. Ghanem in infectious disease, and Dr. Monroy Trujillo, who does uh, nephrology. These guys, I hope some of you have the chance to meet them, or, or if you have, a lot of you have kids in med school, if they happen to interact with these folks, um, it'd be a real privilege because they are the most passionate, like they're like basically like World War, or sorry, not World War, um, WWE announcers in terms of how excited and passionate they are about acid-based uh, disorders and about syphilis, uh, respectively. Uh, the, they're so passionate and uh, it's, you know, right now where people who are pretty, you know, I think a lot of us are pretty jaded and nihilistic, maybe even cynical about some things, when you meet someone who has true passion for what they do as a teacher or as a clinician, like these two do, it's like, it's like breath of fresh air. I feel like I was hypoxic before meeting professors like this. And my joke is if, if, if every professor at Hopkins was like this, we would never have started on sources because there wouldn't be a need to because we'd have the best educators. Uh, but unfortunately it was much more of a great experts of, of people who weren't compensated for teaching so that they, they, you know, the incentives weren't there for them to teach well. Uh, and then the last H is humility. So acknowledging one's own limitations. Um, another physician, David Sackett, said, half of what you learn in med school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is that nobody can tell you which half. So the most important thing to learn is how to learn on your own. And I think that vulnerability of, you know, many of you are in this room because you are the experts in your field, you've accomplished great things, but hopefully most of you, if not all of you, have continue staying committed to lifelong learning and just knowing that the types of stuff you're, you're teaching will be outdated, will be the wrong things, uh, you know, within a few years probably, and the pace is, is compounding. Another example, another great quote is from C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Uh, and so one great physician um, at Hopkins who I, I think embodies humility is Andrew Cameron. And I think it's easy to recognize humility in people who are extremely accomplished because you know you expect them to be you know egotistical and full of pride. And Dr. Cameron is the um, director of surgery at Hopkins. His dad is John Cameron, who invented um, or perfected the Wickle procedure. Uh, and so he is kind of the protege for, for Cameron and you trace the line back and goes to play long and goes to create a field heart surgery and even before that Hal said one of the four founders of Hopkins did everything from the radical one of the main procedures was the first to create the radical executive. The great surgical education of surgical excellence is the one that has been done. But I was in an MM report where he was presenting, and I heard a bunch of other surgeons and physicians present MM reports, but the level of, I think, genuine humility that Dr. Cameron exuded, as well as the amount of time he spent with med students, right? Every week he'd be with me and five other med students who were part of this group and spend a whole hour with us out of his busy liver transplant schedule to talk to us about surgery and about um, you know, what, what advances the medicine could be good. And more important than talking to us, to listen to us, right? Because I just had him on my podcast, and if you ever listen to that, one of the things he said is that it doesn't matter what he does or what he accomplishes as an educator. 
what brings him the most joy is hearing what his students, his mentees, his trainees are passionate about. Like he thrives in that passion. And again, I think that most of you, if not all, definitely the ones who are being recognized for Educator of the Year, probably can relate to that. You know your limitations and you want to be a certain leader to your students. So with that, this is the last slide. Thank you for listening. Um, hopefully this teach uh, uh, resonates and it's an acronym as you like. And I'm, I know I'm missing several letters, so uh, when I'm at dinner or if you can find me later, I'd love to hear from you what other qualities you think make good educators um, that I should update this acronym for. So thank you. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more 